Yo, and hello, everybody. Mike here. Welcome to Bench Clear Media. And today we're doing something slightly different. Uh, we do a lot of talking to other collectors and other people in the hobby on this channel all the time. But today I get the treat to talk to a gentleman who is behind the newest sports card documentary called Behind the Card. And before I get Chris on here, uh, I just want to tell you, I have seen the movie. And he and I are just going to talk about some different things. I have a bunch of questions I want to ask him about the movie itself. And yeah, as you guys are watching, hopefully I answer a lot of the questions that you might be having if you've watched it. Uh, it's one of those things I definitely encourage people to watch it before you form an opinion. I went into it after watching several reviews and I really just said, I'm going to have an open mind about this. And so through this, through this process of talking to Chris, you're going to probably hear what I thought about the movie. And, uh, just a hint. It's not all bad. So here we go. Chris, hey, how are you, man? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on here. That's probably not the best way to start an interview. Hey, it's not all bad. No. <laughs> and you're like, dude, I poured my heart and soul into this movie. Like, come on, man. Give me a break. No. Hey, well, uh, let's roll some positive with some negative. So it's not all, all in one spot each way. <laughs> well, in fairness, tell me first, okay, what started the idea of even doing this? Like, what was your impetus for this movie? Yeah. So, you know, really quickly, um, my dad ran a shop uh, when I was young. So I got familiar with that, went to a lot of card shows, loved collecting sports cards, got back into it after quarantine because I moved from Los Angeles to Vegas. The wife went to Target. I went with her. I was like, oh, saw a box of cards, right? In that special aisle that we all love in retail. And uh, got his eye on Williamson in a prison box and never seen boxes of cards again for a few weeks and started researching and understanding what was going on in the marketplace. I got on eBay, started selling cards because I saw how much they were going for. And uh, about within a month, 30 packages a day, I was uh, mailing out of card sales. And my wife was like, what is going on? So I set her down, watched some stuff online, showed her how crazy stuff was going on. Um, the cards in Vegas are dropped at Target the night before, primarily during that time frame of quarantine um, on a on a Thursday night for early morning Friday. So I forced her to go to uh, Target at like 530 in the morning to see a line to even showcase what that looked like. And after that, we sat down and started to uh, talk about building out a documentary for the space that we all love here. Yeah, that is fascinating um, that just from your newfound kind of renewal of your hobby interest you're like hey there's a story here right yep and there's a story that i think i could tell how did so you start going okay i think we need to make a documentary do you have a lot of experience making documentaries no this is actually my my first documentary actually so uh it's my actual first film if you've seen any of my other interviews you know that i um uh, say I, i've never even had a TikTok, so i don't do filming in general so it was definitely a unique process from, from my end um, within that uh, process of creating a film. And we really wanted to do a theatrical film because my, my wife's more into the filming aspect of things. And um, she saw a need for content from a theatrical perspective um, because quarantine even shut down Disney, right? And, and all those uh, big Sony and, and distributors from that perspective. So we really knew that we thought we'd have enough content based on what was going on in the space to do a large link film. Um, so we set kind of three month time frame. So that was about mid mid 2020 is when the box went down and then you kind of span a couple months of, you know, me selling cards. And then, so you're in the back half of the year, right. Of 2020, when we start to formulate what we're doing and um, we spent a good, the back half of just researching, kind of understanding who's the movers and shakers still in the space, who are the old ones, who are the up and comers, we knew that we wanted to play startups and also long lasting businesses in the space. So we could kind of see what was going on from that perspective of, of growth in the business side. And then um, we started doing interviews. And in November of 2020, we started interviewing our uh, production team and our cinematographer. Because since we weren't in film, you know, one of the big things is how does this look cinematography wise? I didn't want this to look like you know, we were going to do a virtual, you know, meeting over the, over the internet, like everybody else was doing. Being a theatrical film, we needed to be in person, which was tough because of COVID rules in general and, you know, how you have to do things contractually during that time with COVID. Um, so we actually got out and uh, got our really good team put together so that we knew what we were doing just from a production standpoint. 
I run a few businesses. My wife sold a business that uh, essentially went public uh, in 2020, December. So we have a really good business mindset of how to grow businesses. And we just really needed to focus on getting the right people in place and put my uh, kind of what I felt like what was going on in the space between 2016 and 2020 uh, on pen and paper and then in film. So who would you say is your, is the target audience for this documentary, Chris? Yeah. So, you know, we wanted to put something together because the car market space changes month to month now, right? Uh, essentially everything's changing all the time. So I knew I needed to get the film out as fast as possible. It usually takes three to five years to get a theatrical out by the time it's all said and done. We did it in less than two years because we were trying to make sure that the market didn't change too much, which it changed quite a bit this last year, right? Uh, with all that said, um, we think it's for two people. Mainly, I wanted to give individuals that weren't in the space or those collectors that family members, wives, significant others, friends that hear you talking about cards, wonder why you're in cards. I think this was a good setup for them to learn some card 101 and really understand why people were jumping in so quickly and why there was so much talk around it, just like NFTs, just like crypto. A lot of individuals started talking about this very quickly, and we wanted to give them a linear path because I would say the, the card space is a web at this point, and you really can't find your, your way around a web. So a linear path of understanding where to go to start to understand once you watch our film what community you belong in. So for instance, latent sports cards is the breaker, right? If you talk about um, latent sports cards, they don't cuss. They're very kid friendly. That's quite different than some other card breakers out there, right? The entertainment is different in terms of the different breakers. So it's not like I want you to go watch latent sports card breaks, but I want you to go find what breaking company that you fit in as a community so that you as a new collector coming in can find where you see fit to enjoy the way that you want to collect with other people like yourself. Because right now I think people that are coming into our industry are, are like seeing stuff, understanding what's happening, buying a $1,500 box and then realizing they get $40 worth of cards from it sometimes. Right. I don't want that to happen. I want people, cause you'll lose those individuals as collectors long time, you know, long term. So I want them to find a space and a community that will help them. So primarily you know, looking at it from that perspective, it's a lot. It's like, how do we get the rest of the world outside of our small car community? Even if we have millions of people in, in the car collecting community, it's still small community, right? I want everybody else to understand at least what's going on, not necessarily join or become a collector. That's a hope. But at the same time, just so that when you're talking about sports cards, they understand why you're doing it. Right. That yeah, was a long way of saying that. <laughs> that's interesting. The, the two groups you're talking about, people that aren't even familiar with the space and those that are relatively new to the space. What the film didn't address is those of us that have been in the space for a long time. I, I found myself watching it going, I really didn't learn anything new if that's, yeah. and I don't mean that in a rude way. I simply, I've, I've been doing this a long time. I follow social media. I follow what's been going yeah. on. Uh, it's like, okay, it was presented in a, I, I thought you did a, Honestly, you did a great job telling the story that you that you're saying right now that you were trying to tell. I think that you did that, that you told the story of the boom and what was going on um, very well. It didn't do anything for me as a longtime collector in terms of going, man, I, this is uh, informative slash educational slash any of that stuff. It was entertaining yeah. if that. And that maybe matters more than anything, probably. Uh, that's the point, too, I want to make, too, is like for, for a guy that's been in a long time card collector or just, you know, watches every single Chasing Cardboard and every single, you know, sports card investor video and Scotty B cards, right? You, you're seeing this on a day-to-day -day basis. You're getting everything in general, right? And it's really hard to do documentary that's not 10 plus years old. Right. We took on the notion of doing something while it was happening, which is very hard from a documentary standpoint to create. And what I want you to think about from the collector side, if you haven't watched it, is um, the card space changes monthly. Some people say, hey, this is outdated. And even, you know, this just happened a year ago, <laughs> you know, when we filmed it, because we actually filmed it in April uh, through May of 2021. And then we did about six months, seven months of uh, editing from that perspective. So in general, it's as, as fast as we could get it out and for it to be changing monthly and know that that's kind of per se outdated for some individuals just based on how the market has changed. 
that should just give you a time capsule of going back and saying two things. Thank God that's not happening anymore <laughs> and a relief for people that like retail or just remembering, you know, what was happening. Whereas I feel like nowadays you're, we're getting to the point where card collecting is getting back to the collector, uh, into the collector's hands more, uh, as long as you're strategic in, in what you're buying, you know, and, and chasing. So I think if you think about it as that type of piece, I think, to your point, you enjoy it, right? It, it's a, an enjoyment kind of scenario versus a, a learning perspective for you. And that's really hard. We'll, I don't think anyone will ever create a documentary that the card collector is going to absolutely love based on uh, knowledge and learning because everything is out there already primarily, right? Some people like, why Why wasn't there more vintage stories? We like vintage as a card collector. Oh, you are, you're, you're, asking, you're asking yourself one of the questions I was going to ask you, so. Perfect. Let, let's let's go that direction. And I like to say, you know, that's what Chasing Cardboard and, and other relative shows are for in terms of getting to those stories that make sense on a day-to-day day -day basis. But when you think about the mass and what, what the masses need to watch a theatrical film, that's extending beyond the card community, which... There's not a lot of vintage stories out there, I think, that would apply to get enough attention and enough um, knowledge for individuals to say, hey, let me jump in the space, if that makes sense. Well, to be totally fair, I mean, feeling your pain a little bit in terms of maybe what criticisms you've heard about the documentary, Chasing Cardboard, we get the same stuff. It's, hey, we want more of the cards and less of the story. And we're like, that's not what this show is for. This show is for... It's for the two type of people that you're talking about. And we get longtime card collectors that do watch Chasing Cardboard and they enjoy it, but it's not really for them. Um, it's for the masses, right? And so we're trying to tell a story through Chasing Cardboard. We don't get into every detail about the cards and all of that. The cards are the probably the supporting actor of the show the people that are in the show, the, the family stories that we're telling, they're the main protagonists, right? So yeah. it's, I, I get trying to juggle that and you can't cater to everyone. You know, yeah. we've, we've just like given up on that. We're just going to make a show that we think is good and entertaining and potentially, you know, we try to give some basic card information about, Hey, here's what refractors are and mm -hmm. Tiffany's and some stuff like that. But reality is you you can't fit all that into if you want us to make it all of these things it's going to be really long and you're going to get really bored and so yeah. I, I get the challenge of trying to whittle down all of this stuff that happened in 2020 into you know the hour and a half that you did it what i will say is you know our our hobby is pretty bifurcated you've got the collector and you've got the investor flipper yeah. there are plenty of people in the middle that are hybrids i i get it you know you're you're one of them you're you know you you both collect and you sell cards right so anybody that does that is probably in that middle group but you have the the hobby wanting to segment people you're either one of these two things and that first of all that's unfair if you want to call yourself a collector like i do or you just want to call yourself an investor that's fine but trying to fit people in boxes i think is dangerous because you can change, you can change your mind and all that stuff. But my point of that is your film really caters more to the either hybrid people or just the people that experience the boom from the, the dollars, you know, the dollars aspect, the money aspect of that period. Correct. Guys like me didn't care. I mean, I just didn't yeah. like that I had to pay more for the cards that I wanted to buy in yep. terms of what was happening in the modern basketball market. I could have given two craps less. Yeah. You know, um, but I followed all of it. I found it fascinating in terms of what was going on at the time. And sorry, I, I got to get to my questions. I keep. <laughs> um, OK, so the different personalities that you had, the different uh, people contributing to the movie in terms of the interviews that you did. Yeah. How did you come up with that list? What made you pick certain people over other people? How did that come about? Yeah, I, I think that's an unanswered question until you talk to the director like me, right? And so I had I have a collector hat and I have a director hat. So, you know, that that plays a difference in terms of how you do a film in general as well, right? Um, so we interviewed a ton of people. We reached out to individuals uh, that just 
were too busy or didn't want to be in the film. You know, not, not everyone wants to just, you know, take an interview during quarantine. It's really hard to, okay, even get an interview, then figuring out how to schedule it and get on site is, is another issue too. So that kind of took some presence there. And then also, you know, when we talked to different companies, uh, from my perspective, I had to find out how were they going to culturally fit in the film across the board and what role were they playing at the time as well um, to fit in the film. And if you think about it, even though this is a linear documentary, you know, I don't, I didn't want two or three grading companies in it um, that were like, you know, I could have, you know, people, a lot of people ask like, why not PSA, Beckett and SGC? Well, they primarily from the masses, you know, overview, one of them can give the overview of one-on-one -on -one that we need. So then I look at it as, okay, who's bringing the most kind of history that can fit in other areas of the film. And I felt like Beckett just had the most history overall in the marketplace for us to fit in, uh, uh, to fit in the card grading section, because they were able to speak on a lot of other things. I felt like we were going to want to have them in those sections. So I, I kind of took it from that perspective in every single section as we broke down who we wanted to be in the film. Okay. Um, and we can dive into certain scenarios from there. Well, That's a good overview. I think, you know, I, obviously, um, I just went blank, got sports cards. Um, got baseball. Yeah. Yeah. Got baseball cards. Yep. Uh, is it Jeff? What was his uh, name? Joe Davis. Joe. Thank you. Um, he was, you know, an old school, he'd been doing it at least, you know, well, 30 years really, I think. Yep. I think he said he started in 90, if I He's remember. An right. And then his shop, he started in the 90s. Right. And, but it felt to me as I'm watching it, like, okay, Jeff, who I know and like, like, I, I like Jeff as a person, you know, um, I like Brad as a person. Uh, I don't know them great, you know, just in the hobby kind of, and obviously they're, they're influencers in the hobby, but you, it felt like it was all guys that only have been around during this boom period. They by and large, right. Other than Joe, it felt like a lot of people that were, that had capitalized on the boom mm -hmm. and it, it felt like it was only telling one side of it, you know? Um, so not yeah, that I mean, again, nothing against uh, the guys, but I felt it was one sided on that end. Yeah. So the difference between Brad and Jeff, I felt like um, Jeff has a lot more going on from a sports card investor standpoint in terms of like the overall knowledge of the space that they put out. Whereas Brad, was more of an investor targeted of, of, he was on a journey at the time of how do I pay for rent essentially by flipping right. cards, right? So the goal there was to put someone in the film that um, was doing lower end card collecting and have a perspective from there. Um, Brad uh, does a lot of modeling. He's done a lot of commercials. If you think about it from a theatrical film, you have to be able to be on screen correctly as well. Right. Sure. So from a director standpoint, you got to pick out individuals. And I felt like Brad was um, that person that would fit well in that perspective. Um, the way that we came around Joe Davis is we, we actually did Perry Solomon, which is down in Tampa, a card shop uh, owner. Um, we actually were introduced to Joe Davis on the road. Um, and since he was in Atlanta, we actually pulled him in for a secondary uh, interview from that just to make sure we had the right, you know, to have two different interviews from a card shop because we weren't sure how card owners would be on screen. Right. Uh, the last thing we need is someone just, you know, watching paint dry per se from a character perspective. And Joe Davis, uh, I, I think just did a really good job from the way that he spoke and, and brought that older school vibe. Um, so even though he's tied to, I think Jeff Wilson's coaching group, you could say, because they do a lot together. Um, you know, he accidentally got in our film and I think he played a great role in it. So, you know, little things like that happen. Um, you know, we didn't know we were going to have Steve Elk in it. We wanted him in it. We had to get six interviews. Uh, we had six intros before their team really spoke to us about being in it. <laughs> right. So like, it's not like we just wanted to, we just pick and choose, you know, we reached out to Gary V as like a secondary kind of who was, you know, pumping the market at the time from a coaching perspective per se that, you know, has a lot of film experience. Um, you know, so it wasn't, we reached out to Logan Paul in case we want to do Pokemon. Some people just, you know, couldn't be in it, didn't want to be in it. You know, there, there's a route where you, you take, you know, trying to find the right people and you dwindle down by yourself saying no or others saying no to you. Right. 
Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of happened with Joe Davis unexpectedly, actually. I mean, you definitely had a lot of name people that are, that are known in the hobby today. Right. And, yep. and so that certainly lends that that's good for, again, the story that you were trying to tell. Um, yep. I think, again, if somebody wanted to do a documentary on the history of collecting sports cards, you know, uh, those guys might be in the very end of the story. And then, and you've got a bunch of other people that are in the, you know, why didn't you interview Dr. Beckett? I'm very curious about that. Yeah. So, cause we had Beckett in it, right. Essentially right. we just couldn't get it done um, because of COVID, you know, reasons during that time frame and, and calendars um, when we were there. You gotta remember too, like on a theatrical film, uh, like, I don't know how many people you guys have them chasing cardboard and you guys are traveling all the time, but you know, we had like eight, you know, staff outside of me and my wife, Paula, traveling for, you know, uh, April to May, um, flying to every single location on, per, you know, uh, in person, you know, so that's like, you know, eight flights, two ways, eight people, you know, the production cost gets extremely high. If you can't fit into our production, you know, time frame, then it just can't be done. And unfortunately, we couldn't get Dr. Beckett to fit in it. We would love to have him in it. That would have been awesome. Um, it just didn't happen from that timing, you know, perspective. I can call him right now. We can get him on right here. And I know, talk. right? No. Um, I would have to bring a crew of eight down to him, you know, and that, that would take me a week to, to of, of, of cost. I think that's where people don't realize, you know, when you look at like updates to the film, because it's been a year from now, like, why don't you just update it, you know, or put somebody in or, or do something like that. It's a, it per, it's a, it's a very large cost to do something like that. So what was the production budget? for the film yeah so you know you can find it on various sites what the average is out there uh me and my wife uh funded this fully ourselves so this wasn't like sports card investor or beckett or anyone funded this uh, essentially we have no ties to anyone and no one has ties to us and we felt like we me as a collector i wanted to, to do my first film in something that i loved and we put our money where our mouth is you could say and, and went out there and built a feature film on our own backs and uh Essentially, um, I would say a, a documentary of a feature film, you know, is roughly a million to 1.5 million is typically what most people spend. Uh, I told you guys, you know, earlier, I have a, a business background, so I, I cut all the fat off off this thing as much as I could. Typically, there's a 35 to 40 person crew that goes around with you for a feature film. We did it with eight, you know, so uh, if you could imagine, you know, what that looks like, you know, cut it in, in half or a little less is kind of where we were at from, gotcha. from a budgetary standpoint. So. If we wanted to update it, it's going to cost me, let's like, say, another 50K just to update something, right? It just doesn't make sense when the card market changes monthly. We would never get a feature film out, you know? It just would never work out. Plus, you have to go through festival season, which is usually a year long. We cut that in half because we want enough boards up front in the beginning of the year. And it takes six months to, like, sell this to distributor for them to put it on wherever they put it on. So we essentially sold the rights to the American, you know, uh, to the U.S. rights for this to vertical entertainment. So I, I don't own the American rights to it anymore, you could say, from that perspective. And that yeah, took six you, months to do. If you did right? updates, you'd never stop filming because it's always updating. <laughs> yeah. If I was doing that, I would just turn it in a, a I would have a competing chasing cardboard. At there that you point, go. Right? And I would be dropping it weekly. <laughs> you could, yeah, we, we don't mind the competition. There's plenty of room for all of us out there. Um, yeah, but you guys do what you guys do best. So I wouldn't want to well, compete against that. We're... <laughs> <laughs> We're just a little show. And to answer your question, you asked kind of back, not necessarily straightforwardly, but it's just the three of it. It's me, Ty, and Matt. And Matt does all of our camera, sound, editing, filming. Like he's the director. Yep. I mean, so we do it on the super cheap. It's not, <laughs> that's not fair. It's not yeah. inexpensive. Um, but it's not. Yeah. But like for the people out there that don't know, you should have six to seven people with you. Oh, totally you agree. Seven and three. You know, I think that's the reality of, of what we do on the back end of content. And there's always a price to that. You have to, you have to pay everybody what they want to get paid. Right. There's, totally. there's producers that will get paid $1,500 a day, even if they work two hours, because it's a day rate in this field. Right. Yep. So you're paying all those individuals, how you have to pay them is what it comes down to at the end of the day. Yeah, we would love to have a crew of five or six or seven. <laughs> the make show. your life a lot easier. <laughs> you can make... pump content faster too, but that's just sometimes not not the the case, right? Yeah, because ours is a home. Like we're literally 
starting this from scratch as well, you know, yeah. with our own, we're putting our money where our mouth is too. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're totally invested in it and just doing it mainly because we love it, but there's, there's always a financial aspect to everything. I mean, I'm not as much as I love it. Right. I don't just yeah. want to pour money down a, down the drain. Right. So I totally get that. Um, and that's a good point too. I want to make real quick too, is yeah. like, you know, if I'm spending the amount of money, you know, the six figures that I spend on a movie, the, the car, the car community itself is not going to bring that, that, uh, profit back. Right. Essentially. So that's where, from a director standpoint, sometimes I have to take off my collector hat and look at this from a, the theat a theatrical film and say, what are the masses going to like? Right. And that's where some of the stories come out that as a collector, you're not going to like during the film that, you know, the masses are going to like, and they need that from an up and down perspective as you watch, you know, you come in and out of you know, different areas of the film to make sure they actually watch it for an hour and a half and not just watch the first 30 minutes and go away. If that makes sense. How, how easy was Vegas Dave to work with? Yeah. So, um, you He's love or hate Vegas though. Dave. I say that all the time, right? I think people don't realize that Vegas Dave is a genius marketer and a businessman from that perspective. What I mean by you either love or hate him, but he does it from a marketing perspective where you either love or hate him and it works out for him, right? Personally. Um, it was easy because he, he actually, I mean, you saw, he knows a lot about the car community. He's been in it longer than most people would ever imagine. Um, you actually start to like Vegas Dave, I think in a few sections. And then he goes back to being Vegas Dave and you're like, ah, that's why I don't like that guy. Right. If you get around the personality, it's really easy to work with them. Um, and I think from our perspective, it was really easy because we asked him questions and he just uh, did his typical Vegas Dave move on, on how he presented that, which, you know, at the, after the interview, um, you know, a lot of people think of him as a villain to the card space. You know, during the film, he was talking about how the card space was going to go down. So every movie needs a villain. And he, you know, brought that villainous, I think, vibe to the film. So as much as you hate that, you know, he could be in it or some people are like, well, I'm not going to watch it because Vegas Dave is in it. Vegas Dave was one of the top kind of minds out there pushing content between 17 and 2020. Whether you liked what he was saying, he was present very heavily in the time frame that we were, you know, filming. So I, I think in general, because of the super fracture alone and, and what that did, I think it made sense that he was in it. And we asked him a lot of questions, which he spoke a lot different sections. So you actually got him more than you probably expected in our film. No, that's okay. I, I, I'm a big believer in not judging a person till you've spent time with them personally, watching someone and who they are on camera. I, I don't, I'm pretty Switzerland on Vegas Dave, yeah. honestly. Uh, there are things he says, like, I think, well, I can't remember the quote, something about vintage, like he hates vintage or he think it's, thinks it's dumb or terrible or something to that effect. Yeah. What was the quote in the movie? Um, I mean, he even said, like, you know, the Mickey Mantle buy, like, why are you going to invest in somebody that's dead in the ground versus right. somebody that's playing, right? Stuff like that is what you're probably getting at, you know? And I would like argue, very That's heavily in the words that he uses, yeah. <laughs> you know, of uh, the way, but that, that plays a, that played a really good role because as a director, I didn't want to push you one way or another. So if you know, like you probably noticed that when Vegas day came up, Rob go came up, Rob go is very vintage, not modern. And, and Vegas Dave is all modern, not vintage. So we gave you both ends of the story at the same exact time in each sections. And they kind of counterbalance each other to you as a, as someone out there, if you liked more Vegas Dave, what he was saying, you would go find that community. If you like what Rob Go was saying about vintage, you'd go find that community. We never told you in the film which way to lean. We just gave you both perspectives, if that makes sense. I did want more Rob Go as I watched him. Because um, what he said about vintage, I agreed with. You yeah. know, why, why did he buy the mantle? Why did he pay that much? And all that kind of stuff. Most of us can't do that. So you live vicariously through other people. Believe me, I'd love, I would have loved to own the Mike Trout super fractor too. So yeah. it, it's like, you know, but Rob, I think had a great perspective on vintage. Uh, it just felt yeah. that was a very, not, not as much in the film as I wished would were more of that, more of that, but yeah. I get, it doesn't fit perfectly with your story. I get it. 
Yeah, and I think it would just dilute each section because in a theatrical film, you got to move from scene to scene very quickly, right? So there's a lot of moving two cameras from the same person as they're talking. You know, 80% B footage is what you shoot for, which B footage just means like the background when somebody's talking, they're not on it. Because like the last thing you want to do is just watch somebody talk, right? So from a director standpoint, it was very tough to fit in what I wanted across every section. And if we got too much into a section of what you're talking about, then somebody gets bored and moves on before the next section hit. So that's why a lot of times people might think it's more a little bit of card 101 and then move on. What we did was we tried to give a foundation for someone that doesn't know what's going on and then tell the cool story and then move on. Like that was like part of the director role outside of the collector role that I had to take on, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think people realize like we shoot we spend half our time shooting B-roll. Yeah. Like when we're doing a chasing cardboard episode, like people don't understand. Oh, this looks like it. Let's stop. And we have to take, pull everything out and do, it's crazy how much B-roll you have to shoot. You're totally right. Yeah. Um, like one example to kind of make this come to fruition of timing, we flew. So we put a camera on Southwest. I think we flew Southwest to yeah. Puerto Rico for Robco. So we put a camera on as we flew. So we got that. So you'll see like a, a, cl a clip of like, flying into Puerto Rico and then on the road for like five seconds to 10 seconds in the movie to start like Rob goes section, like we're in Puerto Rico, right? Well, we had to drive that and film it. So it was like a good hour and a half plus the filming of, of the plane for us to get like 10 seconds of B footage, right? right? Because we just sped all that up, but like we wouldn't be able to do that unless we went out there and filmed it ourselves. So just definitely like B footage is the hardest part of a film because you need as much as possible I mean, we saw 50 cards at it or more at everyone at everybody's place at PWCC. They have a vault of cards and boxes like we we got what we could as much as we could at the time that we had. And we we barely made it. There's two sections that actually you'll see the same cards in um, that I noticed that we just couldn't we couldn't we didn't have time or any more B footage left. So we had two instances, I think, in the film that you actually see the same cards, whereas, you know, sometimes B footage overlaps. We tried not to do that because but it just takes a long time to get B footage done. So you, you had PWCC They're They're an auction house sort of, you know, kind of de facto auction house. They kind of do their own thing now, yeah. have their own vault, all that fun stuff. Why not any other auction houses, Golden or REA yeah. or any of those types of places? Yeah. So we talked to other auction houses. It wasn't like we just picked PWCC and moved on. Um, one of the biggest reasons they, they house the uh, Mickey Mantle card for Rob. So when we had Rob, when we landed Rob, it, it made it more sense to go with PWCC from that aspect because we wouldn't be able to shoot the card at all if we didn't have PWCC in it, right? Because it was actually housed at PWCC's vault. And what that means is uh, at the very end, we do a hero shot where everyone holds up their card in, in front of them. Um, and Rob Go has his card he's holding. We actually clip that in to make it look like it. he was holding some other card in PSA format uh, with them. So... Uh, that was one of the big reasons. Also, at the time, um, I would say notably, like they were doing just the most transactions, I would say. They also had a big social push. So they had a lot of B footage of how cards were selling. So as you saw, if you watch the film, when we go through what that looks like and they're talking about million dollar cards, we can pump through those quickly. Um, since they own that B footage, we were able to do that contractually with them. Right. And that's a big thing is like, you have to know that every piece that you utilize is is contractually done as well, and which is a big thing for for theatrical films. Uh, we talked to Golden uh, as well. Like uh, we talked to Ken. Ken, um, you know, you guys probably know now. Everybody knows that he has something going on Netflix. At the time, it wasn't really out. Um, we mutually, you know, uh, mutually said no. At the end of the day, he could not sign contractually what we needed and in order for me to sell something, we need that done. So we decided, you know, from a director standpoint, um, I said, look, we're going to, you know, go elsewhere, right? Like it just happens sometimes. So I think, you know, one of the big things is we, I, I interviewed a lot of people across the board, you know, it wasn't like I just chose PWCC and, and went with them, right? Like we, we talked to PSA quite a bit uh, from the grading section standpoint. Right. Um, that's my There's next tree in there, you know, Nat Turner would be and it's like Nat Turner's got a great collection. Right. Uh, but like we already have Rob go, right. We didn't need that many more stories of million dollar collections. Right. Uh, we talked to shine uh, as well. We just, you know, we tried to fit him in. We couldn't really fit him in. So there, there's like other people that we 
got close with, tried to do, but at the end of the day, I had to make a director decision on how people would fit in the film. And that's the reason why we went with individuals like PWCC. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I know there's people out there just screaming like, Mike, you're being way too easy on Chris. <laughs> and Hey, you, then you interview him and you tell him, you ask him what you want to ask him. Um, parts of it did feel a little commercial-ish. This is probably the most controversial thing I'm going to ask you from, yeah. from just to, <laughs> the NFT stuff. The I know that was, you know, that was a big deal. Fractional ownership. Yep. Right. Uh, all that stuff. From the minute all that stuff came out, it felt very trendy to me. Like this uh-huh. is not long lasting in this hobby. It, it'll be cool for a little while. Sure enough. I mean, yeah, there's experience matters right to me in this yeah. hobby been there seen it this ain't gonna last you know it's a fad um you spent it, some of it felt very commercialish just like you were just not you well you made the film i guess yeah. but like okay. hey you're promoting these things in a way that i thought was not telling the other side of that story yeah it felt very again here's the good things about this or here's what this is but oh, be careful because of these potential uh, pitfalls. Yeah, I think Vegas Dave helped in that perspective. So, for instance, when we talked about fractional ownership, you know, he came in and was like, Frac- "Fractional ownership is just ridiculous." That's true. Uh, he it's did the dumbest thing ever, right? But so, two ways of answering this for you, because you're you're right, right? There's just some things that are going to be always seem commercial because it's a business on the back end right? When you're talking about some things, not just the person on the screen. So when you have business people in there, it's going to feel that way a little bit. Um, and then on the front end of that, um, you know, you got to look at it from the masses and what they're going to perceive, you know, what's, you know, what's a commercial and what's not a commercial. And then you also got to think about, um, where was I going with this? There's a third, a third thing that I was thinking of that I lost okay. there with the Vegas day piece, but you got to. Um... We just don't want to. I mean, you're right. I forgot about the Vegas Dave where he was totally poo pooing on fractional ownership. Um, and I think most collectors would agree. Fractional ownership is like, no, I want the card. I don't want. A piece uh, I, of would, the card. I would never do fractional ownership myself. I'm not. Yeah. A, I'm a fan of owning the card myself. Yeah. But, oh, so like, here's the thing. Sneaker heads came into the card flipping space, right? Right. And right. That started. So when you think about it from a director standpoint, you know, who's going to come in and do collecting? When you talk about the NFT stuff, you know, crypto and NFT has a big space that, that, was, bloom, that was blooming at the time. A lot of money was moving in. Um, so for them to understand that there is an NFT aspect of the card collecting, we'll get them to come in and do NFTs that they know what they know best if they're collecting NFTs in general which will then hopefully get them to go out and buy a box of cards when they're at Target, if that makes sense. That, yeah. that was kind of one of the directions as well from that end um, when you're when you're talking about different sections of, of what was going on at the time frame. But I've always felt that throughout all of this process, the last three or four years, if you want to call it that, of <laughs> kind of the boom period, that how do we, great, people are coming to the hobby. Welcome, great, come into the hobby. And you use the word collecting. They're not really collecting. Because they are collecting means hoarding is a synonym for hoarding. Uh, They are in the hobby and they're bringing lots of money. How do we turn those people from temporarily being in our hobby to permanently being in our hobby? And I don't know that anybody's, you know, figured out that magic bullet yet of how to, they just have to, because to me, I love the cards. I could, I'd buy them all for a dollar. I could care less. I like that they're worth money. I like that they have terminal value someday and all that. I'm not, trying to be naive and, and saying yeah. that I don't care about the money at all. It's just way down the list of why I buy an X certain card. Yeah. The money parts down the list of why, right? Yep. These people are coming in and the, and the reason they buy a card is the money's the first thing reason they buy it. It's not because they like LeBron James or any, you know, they may not even know basketball at all. Might yeah. not even be fans of the sport. It's the money thing that, I think drives when collectors watch your film, that's going to drive them nuts. And that it's all about, it feels like it's all about the money when we see the hobby very differently and have it view it from a different lens. 
Yeah. But no, I, I agree with that. Film. You didn't make the film for me. I get it. Yeah. You know? and, and I totally understand what you're coming at. And I, I think, you know, from a masses perspective, like the money is going to move them to investigate the card space more than another story about some card that they don't really connect to themselves that me and you hoard. Right. I think that's one mindset that like as a collector, you got to understand how are we, you know, and then like I mentioned earlier, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do a hit piece. You know, part, part of this is, you know, some of the things that want to be done almost feels like a hit piece to me in terms of like, you know, what, why was it like, I could have been harsher, you know, outside of Vegas, Dave doing the piece with fractional ownership, we could have went into a harsher reality of what that looked like and actually did some back end, you know, data on the screen to show that, but then that would be more of a hit piece from that end versus giving them, you know, what Jeff said about fractional ownership and then what Vegas Dave said against it and then allowing them to go on the internet and find out more about what was going on and see if they wanted to, you know, investigate that. My job was to give them the knowledge of every single aspect of the space that was going on in order for them to go find their community. So that was one thing I think we forget to as, as collectors, as we're watching this, it's like, to your point, we don't want somebody just to come in as an investment, but we do need to get them to understand that there is an investment reality here to get them to perk their interest enough to come see what's going on in the card collecting community. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I totally just had this epiphany as I'm sitting here listening to you talk about that and what you just said in that, I'm always going to view every sports card video or film or show that I watch through my um, worldview of the collecting, right? I'm going to have my own perspective, my own experience and history and, and thoughts and biases and all of those things. When I watch anything, I can't get rid of it. No one can get rid of, you can't get rid of yours. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you watch the film, I would tell you, understand that you're going to have your own lens that you see this through. And try to step out of that if you can. It's it's difficult to do, no doubt. Um, so I was watching it with my personal lens and going, "Hey, where's where's the stuff that I really care about in this film?" And Rob Grow was one of those. I'm like, "Oh, this is great," you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other stuff is fascinating and interesting. Uh, can we talk about grading for? I'm sorry. Yeah, and and just to comment on that too for those you know, investors that haven't seen it, that want to see it, that are not investors, but collectors, right? Yeah. Watch it with your family member so that you're not just sitting there by yourself saying, this is not for me. You watch it with the family member and they start to bring up things that happen on the screen. And to your point is entertainment. Even if you don't like the film, you're going to be entertained. Like no doubt. Like you're going to see that like things are going to happen and you're going to be, you're going to be able to get through the hour and 30 minutes, right? As a collector, just from entertainment purposes, I think. But if you sit and watch it with someone that doesn't really understand the car community space and you hear their reaction and then you can explain to them more as you guys are going through the film, I think you'll enjoy the film more than watching it by yourself, if that makes sense. And at worst, you can pause it and go, that's a bunch of BS because you can give your perspective yeah. on what your experience has been and what you like or don't like about different things brought up in the film, right? Yeah. You can like my dad's an old school collector. He absolutely hates Vegas Dave. He saw a comment, Vegas Dave do a comment on vintage and he was like, I hate that guy. And so, <laughs> right? like, and then my sister's like, I'm pro Vegas Dave, but she's, she's way younger than me, you know? Right. So like, you know, there, there's going to be a different perspective and, and when they watch it collectively, they enjoy it together. Right. So definitely don't think of this as like, I'm a car collector and I'm going to watch a, a documentary on car collecting. If you, yeah. if you read the description, it's the rise of the card collecting uh, of the, card collecting industry in the new era between 2016 and 2020. Just know that when you're getting into it, if that makes sense from a collector perspective. So the last topic I want to bring up is the grading part. And you, uh, you did, you talked about, I mean, Jeff talked about PSA and the boom and the shutdown and mm -hmm. what that did to the space. Did you try to reach out to SGC or, I mean, you talked to Beckett and talked to them about grading. Um, yeah. I think at the time SGC would have been the only other one that was really playing in the space. If you think about when we started this, right. Um, again, like because of Beckett's kind of old school, you know, industry uh, knowledge throughout, we just decided to go with them. Um, one of the big things, not PSA is some of the contractual stuff just didn't work out. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't be in a position where I couldn't use what I needed to uh, as well. 
Um, so that kind of hurt. Also, California was extremely hard during COVID. I mean, they're kind of COVID still in some some cases in terms of what they do out there in California. So if you can imagine during lockdown timeframes, like we would fly in and we'd have to find a testing site instantly. In California, you, you had to do a lot more from a, a contractual standpoint that we just couldn't do. And they were positioned in California, right? So at the end of the day, um, that kind of all affected everything. Um, and I myself did not consider SGC, uh, I, I considered them third and mostly vintage at the time span. I think if you look back at when this was filmed, it was BGS and, and PSA kind of the top two. Uh, people ask why HGA then, right? I wanted to show what a startup looked like and what could change quickly in a space. And, you know, you can't even argue the fact that HGA grew faster than any other startup during that time frame that we filmed, right? So if you look at it as like what was happening in the time space, like let's say they did 200,000 cards that first year. Think about 200,000 cards times $27. They like no one makes them, uh, no business makes three to $5 million in their first year, right? Like HGA was doing those things very quickly. So we wanted to show what like you could do in a quick matter of time in the space. Um, people say like that aged bad, right? From that perspective. Um, but at the end of the day, if we put SGC in it, it would be essentially the same as Beckett in my mindset in terms of like how we had to position it. So at the end of the day, we chose one. Fair enough. Um, Did I answer what you wanted there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, it, it felt like grading became such a big part of the hobby in the boom. And, and it felt like that didn't, that segment wasn't as developed as maybe it could have been. I agree. Uh, and remember the masses won't look at this card space as like the grading aspect as being as big as we all see it as. Right. So I, I didn't want to get too lost in that section. Uh, if we, if we expanded it more, is the reason enough. why we didn't put more into it. Um, I also note that I'm a, I'm a PSA grader. I've submitted over 25 submissions to PSA, thousands of cards. I have not submitted to Beckett. SGC will be my first one with 2022 Chrome being $9 a card. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to note that like, yes, I chose Beckett, but like I only grade currently in PSA format because I'm a collector and an investor and a eBay seller. And I know that if I sell eBay cards, I need to have them in a PSA case to make my most profit when I sell a card. Um, so I do want to clarify that if anybody wondered if I was just chose them because of BGS. I don't know. I appreciate the transparency. I've never done a BGS submission ever. Um, and I'm friends with Dr. Beckett. Like it's not, uh, it's nothing personal. You got to do what makes the most for your collection or whatever you're trying to do in the card space. Right. So, yep. um, man, my phone is just blowing up. I could have, we could have done this interview the hour before and I wouldn't have had a single phone call and my dog wouldn't have barked and she's really trying to get a hold of me. I need to tell her I cannot talk right now. Julie, I love you, but um <laughs> she's cracking. Oh, she's killing me. She's like trying to call me again for the third time. She must really need me. Um I had something else I want to talk about and I totally blanked on it. So, I may ask you privately later, but man, uh First of all, thanks for coming on here. I know you're tired of doing interviews and talking to people. Maybe you're not tired. of It's your baby, right? It's your project. You love talking about it. Uh, I appreciate your transparency. People are, you'll be fascinated. I want you to try to read the comments later on this in about three or four hours because you'll see people razzing on me for not asking you tougher questions. But the reality is I didn't feel, I got a lot of questions from people that I thought were unfair. and were just like, why do you want, why do you need, why does that matter? You know, if you don't like it, don't watch it. You know, that's how I feel about all content. If it's not for you, don't watch it. But if you're curious and you just want to be entertained or whatever, uh, watch it, you know, so make a personal decision. Don't, and, and don't be mad at me for not asking questions that you wish you would have asked. Um, I just, there were some, Pretty harsh questions, actually, that I got privately. Yeah. I mean, if you have a question that you want to ask at who's behind the car is our Instagram. Feel free to message. My team will get it to me and I will be happy to answer what, what you guys want to hear out there. And just remember, like, there's contracts that you have to sign with every single individual. If you saw a kid with a face on screen, they signed a piece of paper, right? 
So at the end of the day, you got to get everybody on board that's willing to sign a contract. Some people aren't willing to do that, right? And we built a film that was in the most controversial time frame of all of us as collectors. We really were shut out for a year and a half, I felt, where you couldn't buy cards unless you were gambling. And that's not what collecting is all about, right? We essentially, uh, as Steve Aoki says, things go up, they go down. But guess what? They go up again. And when it comes to cardboard with guys pictures on a piece of cardboard we as collectors know that should be zero dollars at some time right if you think of that aspect uh, and we still collect it so uh, don't think it's an old school collector you know journey this is what happened in a crazy time frame in our space that i think in 10 years you'll watch it again you'll remember that crazy time frame and, and appreciate it well chris i appreciate your perspective i appreciate your willingness to come on and you I will tell everybody, he said, ask me anything you want, um, save one topic, which I wasn't, we're not going to talk about, but it was pretty much open season if I wanted to. And this wasn't, this is, I just wanted to hear from you, Chris, directly and ask you some of the questions that I had as I was watching it. I was taking notes as I was watching the movie. And, uh, and ironically, I wrote it down a lot of questions that ultimately got answered later as I kept watching. You know, it was kind of funny. I was like, oh, what about this? And then you, somebody would come on during that segment and answer it. And I'm like, okay, I guess I don't need to ask that. He handled that or whatever. Uh, so good job. I know you put a lot into it and I know it's hard and, you know, hopefully lots more praises than criticisms come your way and best of luck to you in the future, man. Thanks. Appreciate me on Mike. You guys do great things over there. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of what you guys do. So thanks a lot for having me on. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Or I'll talk to you guys later. I'll talk to him right now since I hang up with you guys. See you guys later. Keep collecting.